Good morning, friends from Callahonda Baptist Church. We're here today to worship the Lord. Um, unfortunately, not in our buildings since uh, because of these new regulations, but we are so glad that we can still worship the Lord from our homes. Just a reminder to please stay tuned after the sermon for an announcement about next week's service. Let me read for you from Isaiah 55, just a few verses um, scattered through that chapter. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come by and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why would you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that that does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout and giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Let's worship together.
Good morning, friends at Kalahanda. We're back together once again with our discipleship program. I'm calling it Mind Space. If you're new to us, we're memorizing one verse a month, 12 this year. We're working on Isaiah 9 6 this morning. Let's read it slowly together as I read. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. If you're new to us, I remind you that these verses were written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. This is one of the great passages of the Bible that predicts a coming Messiah. And just to flesh this out for you a little bit, I want to read a little bit more of the context of this verse. I'm going to jump back up to verse 1 of chapter 9 and start reading there. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And then there's several verses talking about the conflict and tumult that'll be at the end of days and that will surround the coming of this Messiah. And we come to our verse, jumping down to verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then it goes on next verse, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And you can just imagine how excited the people at the time of Jesus were when some of them began to think that maybe Jesus was this person. And then later, how disappointed they were when Jesus didn't bring them a political kingdom. He brought them a spiritual kingdom of the heart, but promised that a real live king with a real live kingdom would be coming and was still in the offing. And that is what we're still waiting for, just like Isaiah was waiting for Christ back in his day. And it will happen specifically, historically, just as it happened for those at the time of Isaiah who were looking ahead to the time of the Messiah. So if you're new to this passage, you haven't heard this before, I hope you find this encouraging and thought-provoking. And for those of us who've known this for a long time, it's so wonderful just to reread these verses, especially at this time of year. These are great Christmas verses. We read them at Advent time and remember how God has worked out history to his purposes. So soak in these and enjoy them this week. We'll gather around them again next week to review. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of the Savior The hope of nations Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save he is mighty to say forever author of salvation heroes and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill Everything I believe in Now I surrender Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation 
to say, He is mighty to say, forever, author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the I can only imagine that for many of you, as for me, the news that we're going back to some form of modified shutdown is just discouraging. We all have COVID fatigue and it gets to a point where you just hunger for just being out there and being with people the way that we used to be. To me, it's a reminder that we probably don't have as much control over our lives as we think we do. And for our prayer time here this morning, I just want to focus in on that point. And I'm going to be praying out of Psalm 23. It's a reminder of the fact that we do walk in the valley of the shadow of death. We do not know where we are going. And ultimately, our fate and the fate of the world rests in the hands of God. 
I also want to just encourage you, these tragedies have happened in the past. This will end. This is going to go the way of the many, many pandemics that have happened down through the course of history. And we are going to turn a corner on this. My heart goes out to those of you who may be living alone or are dealing with some of these issues functionally alone, even if there are other people in the house. And that's why I want to pray for you right now. And take these verses from Psalm 23 very, very personally. I pray them for you. I pray them for all of those of you who have health concerns as well and for whom this pandemic brings many questions even about whether and when to go to see a doctor or to go to a hospital. Let's pray together. Father, you are our shepherd during these days. You say, I shall not want. And I want to pray that promise for those in our congregation who look ahead and do not know where your provision is going to come from. I pray that you will honor your name by honoring the promises in your word, Father. You promise to make us lie down in green pastures and to lead us beside still waters. And Father, we confess that that is not the sense that we have right now. We don't feel the sense of peace. We have the sense that the world is not as it should be and that the future is uncertain. But Father, we do wish to understand what you mean when you say that you can restore our soul in any context. That is what I pray for my brothers and sisters at Callahonda Baptist Church. I pray that you would lead all of us in paths of righteousness, that you would do this for your name's sake. Once again, we put your name and the glory of your name on the line, Father. We have surrendered our lives based on promises coming from you that we understood from this book. And so, Father, we pray that you will be true to your name's sake. Even though there are people I'm praying for right now who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I pray, Father, that they will not fear evil, not because it isn't there or that evil is not worth fearing, but simply because you are there to protect them. For you, Lord, are a rod and a staff. Father, be a comfort to those in our congregation who may be living alone, who may be dealing with underlying health issues that makes this whole pandemic seem more frightening than it is to many. Father, prepare a table before us. You say you can do this in the presence of our enemies. In this case, you can do this in the presence of our troubles. Father, for those in our church who are working or need to work or are trying to work and not able to find clients or to find work, I pray, Lord, that you will undertake for them, that to those who need clients, you will bring clients, that to those who need work, they will find it. You anoint our head with oil, Father. You are the God who lifts us up when we are unclean, unworthy, smelly. You are the one who washes us. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And we shall dwell in your house, O Lord, forever. A thing that frames our life and our desires in our goals, and our attitudes. May our life be shaped by this belief, not simply because it's knowledge, but because we are children of the King, and we long to be with you, and we long to live in your house, and we long to be your servants in a kingdom that you will rule. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Uh, welcome from a sunny UK and welcome to all of you.
that are in church, if we're still meeting in church, and to those of you watching at home. A missionary in Africa many years ago used to tell a story about a woman who would come to every service accompanied by her dog. She would sit in the aisle at the back of the church and at the end of every service when the pastor gave the invitation to go forward for prayer, she would go forward along with her dog. Now the woman's husband was a very hard abusive man and in fact he despised her Christian lifestyle and used to beat her so severely that one day she died. After her death, he began to notice that every Thursday evening at about 7pm, the dog would disappear for a couple of hours. And also every Sunday morning, the dog would leave at around 9am and return later to round about noon. And again, every Sunday evening, the dog would leave for a couple of hours and then later return. Now the man's curiosity got the better of him, so he, one day he decided to follow the dog. And he followed it all the way to the church and he took a seat in the back to watch. The dog sat down near the aisle in his usual place and at the end of, every, at the, end of the service, the dog went forward to take his place at the altar where the man's wife had often been prayed for. And he was so touched in his spirit that he too went forward and gave his life to Christ. So God used a dog to lead a hardened sinner to repentance. Now, I doubt we have such a dramatic story to tell, but I'm sure we each have our own story about how God worked to bring each of us to salvation. And this week we're starting a new series looking at how Jesus met others. Jesus is the focus of our faith and looking at how different people responded to Jesus will help us consider how Jesus impacts our lives. And this week we're starting by looking at Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. So I'm going to read from John chapter 4 starting at verse 3. So he, that's Jesus, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. I read a headline a few years ago in an English paper that asked, Are you feeling tattered? The article went on to explain that tattered stands for tired all the time. And the headline struck a chord with me and I kept passing an advert on the London Underground for an energy supplement which asked if I was tired 
of being tired. Now I confess I tried it, but unfortunately it didn't do anything for me. I suspect that many of us lead busy lives that cause us to often feel drained. And yet we live in an age where we're constantly under pressure. I don't remember my dad ever getting home late when I was young. But these days, working late seems to be the norm. And smartphones and laptops mean that work can't be simply left at the office. And I suspect that during lockdown with people working from home, people have discovered the importance of a better work-life balance. So it will be interesting to see whether people just return to their old ways when COVID is less of a concern. That said, though, I thought that when I gave up full time work, life would be less stressful. But it seems everyone these days feels under enormous pressure, whether they're at school, looking after the children, out at work or retired. We all seem to live stressful, busy lives. And ironically, all of this in an age where we've never had so many so-called labour saving devices. So reading our passage in John, I was struck by the fact that Jesus sat down by the well because he was tired. I suspect it's one of those details we miss as we rush on to the heart of the story. I also noticed that Jesus didn't accompany the disciples into town. So it may be possible to infer that Jesus was more weary than his disciples. I suspect many of us read our Bibles in bite-sized pieces and don't read many chapters at a time as we might as if, if we were reading a novel. And if we did, we'd be struck by how Jesus hardly ever had two minutes alone. We read that the disciples and the people were constantly demanding his time and his attention. So it's comforting to know that Jesus can relate to how we feel when we too feel shattered through mental weariness and exhaustion. But it's also important to see how Jesus responded when feeling tired himself. Jesus would often withdraw to lonely places to pray so that he could go on in the strength of the Holy Spirit. But in this instance, though, it doesn't say that he sat down by the well to pray, but merely that he sat down because he was tired. Now, if you're anything like me when I'm feeling tired and looking for a bit of me time, I don't feel like doing anything or at least nothing constructive. I'll probably choose to veg out and watch TV or rather let the TV wash over me. So we find a Jesus at the beginning of our passage who's feeling tired and who's allowed his disciples to go into town so he can take a break from all the demands on him. And guess what? Along comes a woman. Now, in the culture of the day, Jesus could have ignored her and nothing would have been considered strange. Indeed, it would have been considered proper for a Jewish man not to be seen speaking to a woman he wasn't related to. And the fact that she's a Samaritan woman would have made it even more socially correct to ignore her. And I suspect if it had been me, I suspect I might have thought, you know, I've been ministering to thousands. I'm tired and I've just got to relax. And that choice was available to Jesus. But that's not what he did. Jesus reached out to others even when he was at the edge of physical exhaustion. And interestingly, or possibly we might say sadly, Nowhere in the Bible are we told to slow down and take it easy. Now, some of you might want to quote Matthew 11 at me, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
But Jesus is referring to the fact that he doesn't put heavy legal burdens on us in order for us to receive God's blessing. Unlike the Pharisees who made all sorts of demands on the people. However, when it comes to our Christian life, the Bible constantly tells us to press on. Don't get tired of doing good. Run the good race and so on. Now, I remember the first time I went to my previous church in the UK, the minister was preaching on stewardship and how God calls us to give of our time and our talents as well as our money. And he was also gently reminding the mainly retired congregation that if you were in your 60s, you were relatively young to the rest of the congregation. And you might even be considered the youth group. And Alan went on to say that it's often tempting to reach a certain age and feel you've reached a point where you can put your feet up and pass on the responsibility of service to others. However, the Bible certainly never suggests we reach a point where we can take it easy and retire from service. We only need to think of people like Moses and Abraham to see that age is no barrier to service. Moses led the people out of Egypt when he was 80 and Abraham set out from Haran in response to God when he was 75. And perhaps we see church as a place to recharge our batteries, but it's also a place to serve Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says, of, says that our leaders are given to the church to equip his people for works of service. So yes, we do come to church to be built up, but it's so that we can be equipped to serve the Lord. However, we don't just serve him at church, but we're also called to serve him outside the church. We would have expected Jesus to reach out to someone when the crowds were watching him. But in this passage, he reaches out when no one is watching. Jesus overcame his weariness because the Samaritan woman had a weary soul that needed the living water that he then goes on to talk about. The Lord just doesn't just call us to serve him on a Sunday or in other church capacities, but he calls us to a life of service and a life of sharing his love with others. However, Jesus doesn't just call us to serve him in our own weakness, but he also promises us empowerment to serve him and the filling of his Holy Spirit. In verse 10, we read, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, on the surface, it sounds like Jesus was simply saying that if she had known who he was and asked him for a drink, he would have given her clean, sparkling, flowing water instead of the comparatively stagnant water from Jacob's well. However, we have the advantage of knowing that the living water that Jesus was talking about was the Holy Spirit. As we read a little later in John chapter 7, Jesus says, If a man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And John then explains, by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So what Jesus was saying to the woman is that nothing will ever satisfy our deepest longings and our deepest dissatisfactions except for a long and continuous drink of God, the Holy Spirit. So whilst coming to Jesus is our first act of faith, we then need to drink and keep on drinking. 
In other words, Jesus is talking about having a persistent and ongoing relationship with him. And the thought is similar to the references in John chapter 6 of Jesus being the bread of life, which we considered a few weeks ago. Bread doesn't just satisfy you, or rather bread doesn't satisfy you, unless you eat it. And in a similar way, water doesn't quench your thirst unless you drink it. And Jesus will satisfy the needs of our hearts as long as we come to him and keep coming to him in persistent faith. And the way in which the woman goes for water every day could almost be a picture of the disappointments of the world. Every day she goes out to get her water, but every day she has to go back again. And this is just what the world is like. You turn to something hoping for purpose and satisfaction. Maybe you look to money or relationships or worldly pleasures or to fame and, you know, and so on. But everything proves disappointing. And so you look to more and more to quench the thirst of your soul. But no matter how many journeys you make, you still find no end to the seeking and the searching. And for many of us, the futile search for satisfaction shows itself in the when syndrome. When we're young, we think life will be better when we become teenagers. And when we're teenagers, we dream of becoming an adult. And then we start to think everything will be OK when we're married and have a family or a good job. And finally, we pin our hopes on when we're retired and when we no longer have to work and the kids have left home. And the fact is, trying to quench our thirst with the things of the world is like eating a Chinese dinner. No matter how much we eat, in a short time, we're hungry again. And perhaps like me, you've been struck by the number of rich and famous people who you might consider have everything they could possibly wish for, and yet who are desperately sad and often seem to turn to suicide. And the truth is that those who try to quench their thirst from the natural wells of life will never be able to satisfy their deepest thirst. Jesus says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. And I think it's important to pick up on the imagery in verse 14 of the living water being like a spring rather than a well. Water doesn't spring up from a well, it has to be drawn up. The woman at the well had to do the hard labour of endlessly heaving up heavy water. And the Christian's position is different because the power of the Holy Spirit springs up within us. Although we shouldn't get complacent as the living water of the Holy Spirit isn't completely automatic, there is still a sense that just like the woman at the well, we need to drink daily. We need to daily come to Jesus to drink of him and to allow him to minister to us as he was willing to do to the woman in our reading. And perhaps we're tired and find it hard to make the effort to drink of him. But just like our bodies need food and water, we need to ensure that we remain spiritually healthy by daily coming to him to seek his refreshment. I remember a few years ago reading in the newspaper um, that they were remarking how slim the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer was looking one budget day. And apparently he'd been using the 5-2 diet. And you may recall that involves eating five days a week and fasting two days. And whilst it may be possible to fast two days a week, it's certainly not healthy to go without food for any length of time. 
and it's certainly dangerous not to drink for any length of time. And yet surveys of Christians suggest we're not very good at spending time reading our Bibles and praying. When I was young in our church youth group, we used to jokingly call our Bible reading notes every other day with Jesus. However, if we want to enjoy the blessings of the living waters that Jesus talks about in our passage today, we need to come and drink of him daily. Jesus' offer of the living water of the Holy Spirit is available to all of us. First of all, we must sense our need of him and thirst for him. And then we must drink by coming to him daily. Perhaps this week it would be good to consider whether our lives are like a Chinese dinner. Are the delights that you pursue satisfying for a short time and then gone? Or is your life a well of living water springing up inside of you with the joy of a relationship with Jesus so that you'll never thirst again? If you are thirsting for more of God, why not ask God for that spiritual water? But most importantly, we need to remember that we need to keep coming back to him daily and learning to draw on him more and more. So as I close, let me read these words from Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without cost. I'll say that again. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let me close with prayer and I'm going to I'm going to be looking at those words and turn those words into prayer. Lord, if we are thirsty, and I'm sure most of us should and could be thirsting for more of you. Lord, we, we want to come to those living waters and we acknowledge, as Isaiah says, we, that come those who have no money, come buy and eat. Buy without money. Lord, there is nothing that we can bring to you that can justify or, or warrant you us you giving us your living waters. And yet you promise that those who come will receive. And Lord, why do we spend money on what is not bread and labour on what does not satisfy? So often we turn to the things that seem tangible in this world. And yet you are the ultimate reality. You are the King and Lord of this universe. You are eternal. Everything around us only exists because of you. And Lord, we want to eat what is good and we want to delight in the richest affair. Lord, we want to give ear to you. We want to come to you and listen to you that we might live, that we might receive your living waters. And long, and Lord, we long to seek you now while you may be found. Lord, we call on you while you are near. Lord, we long for your living waters. Lord, we thirst for more of you. Amen.
Thank you for having joined us for our worship service this morning. I wanted to announce that next week, which will also be an at-home online service, we are gonna have communion together. So if you think about it, you could prepare for having the elements, bread and wine or water or juice or whatever works for you together. And I will lead us by video through the act of communion together, which we'll share online. Obviously, we don't know what the future holds in terms of what the Junta of Andalucía will decide moving forward. Right now, it's just these two weeks that we are limited to crossing between municipality borders. We're hoping it's just two weeks, but uh, watch our website and keep track of the news either on our WhatsApp groups or just by going to our website to see if you should come to church if you wish to join our in-person services when they resume, which we pray will be very soon. Thanks for having been with us. It was great to be together.